Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Bellis. I am the Director of Marketing at JMIR Publications. Um, this is our inaugural webinar um, in collaboration with the Society of Digital Psychiatry and JMIR Mental Health. Uh, we have um, a couple of fantastic panelists on the webinar today. Um, some quick housekeeping. Uh, we are going to be recording the webinar. Um, it has been recorded and we will make it available um, to all registered attendees, um, whether in attendance or absent um, for the webinar, depending on your, on your time zone. I know it might be difficult to make it. Um, and with that, I will pass it on um, to John Toros, um, who will be introducing our panelists um, if you have any questions, we do have the uh, question and answer module open um, within um, Zoom meetings, and we'll be able to monitor that and be able to answer your questions as well. Over to you, John. Excellent. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, JMIR, for making this happen with the Society of Digital Psychiatry. I think I'm thrilled that we are kicking off this set of webinars. We plan to have many more of them, so for anyone listening, if you want to share your exciting work, you are more than welcome to. We're open to new proposals. We're open to people from across the world doing terrific and wonderful work. The goal of these webinars is to be brief, about 30 minutes, to have our guest speakers present for about 20 minutes, and then to take your questions and then to follow up with people offline. We know that your time is limited. There's so much happening in the world right now. So today we have two fantastic speakers. One had to quickly step away, he'll be back. But the one who stepped away is Oren Osman, who's a senior lecturer in nursing and co-director of the Bioethics and Law Center at the Faculty of Medicine at the Samueli Initiative for Responsible AI in Medicine at Tel Aviv University. And we are joined by his close colleague, Amir Tal, PhD, who's a chief scientist at a mental health recovery organization in Israel as well as part of the Sam Welly Foundation Initiative for Responsible AI in Medicine at Tel Aviv University. And clearly you all signed up for this. We know what we're talking about, but this is such a hot topic in digital psychiatry, digital mental health itself, of what is AI, what is changing, what is the same, what are we going to do with it? So I wanted to basically break this brief time up into asking our panelists, what are the real potentials of, of AI, not just kind of we could use a chatbot to, to say how we're feeling? Where are we really going with this at a deeper level? And then, of course, ask the harder question of what do we have to be careful with? And then open up your questions, and then we'll talk at end about the special edition that these two scholars are editing and is still open to paper. So maybe I'll just open up and again and say, we've all heard of chat GPT. We've seen different parts on it. We've seen some cases of unethical uses of it in mental health. But what is the real potential for each of you? What, what are we really moving towards? And I'll, I'll give the floor to you guys. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, John. Uh, maybe I'll start briefly. And I think that uh, we should distinguish between uh, two main uh, uses that we can uh, uh, benefit from uh, in terms of uh, AI and generative AI in specific. Um, so one thing is the uh, aspects of using it uh, to uh, deal with the professional burnout and all the administrative ad administrative tasks uh, that uh, all, we all know that mental health professionals don't really like. And generative AI can do it uh, in a... Um, uh, can really assist with it and, and really augment uh, uh, the work. And in that sense, uh, they can focus on clinical work other than, uh, you know, uh, taking documentation or uh, record uh, meetings, etc. So I would say that automation and note taking uh, and other uh, kind of administrative work uh, is, is really one benefit that uh, we can uh, um, already uh, that we can see. And the other aspects is the uh, clinical aspects, personalization, uh, better um, uh, 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 diagnostic uh, processes and uh, treatment. And that's, I think, that we should do in a more, uh, we should be more cautious about it. And 
and we and, and I will elaborate on it uh, later. But um, maybe Orin can uh, talk a little bit more about these two aspects. Sure. Other aspects, yeah. Sure. So I, I think I mean touched upon some of the things, and it's even hard to differentiate. I think between the uh, let's say uh, tasks that are more technical and the ones that are more of uh, clinical uh, aspects, because in a way, some of the clinical work uh, requires uh, note taking or uh, coding and so on. And uh, it's quite remarkable to see that uh, current technologies and current models could already be quite good at uh, summarizing, at uh, coding, choosing the correct codes, at uh, diagnosing based on different uh, cases that they uh, read. Um, at doing many of the tasks that we assumed in the past would be really human uh, uh, based and so on. So that's, uh, I think, something that could be at least used as a co-pilot in diagnostics, not necessarily to replace or to offer a fresh perspective, but sometimes um, it is uh, just helpful uh, to have some of the work uh, uh, quickly prepared and you just need to go through it and and it could find a lot of things that you're looking for and uh, so it's technical but it's also important because you don't really also always know all the history the relevant history and so on so it could actually sometimes close some gaps uh, that are relevant um, especially when time is limited um, it could be used for even for treatment plan related issues I, I always refer to it currently as a co-pilot or as an assistant or something of that uh, sort. Um, I think another element that is really, really important is the personalization that one could uh, assume that it could be good at. Um, so a lot of work falls into uh, adapting things to a specific patient, to their needs, to their preferences, to their unique psychosocial um, circumstances. And um, depending on, on tokens and on technology and on money and so on, um, generative AI, AI today uh, could do some some of those things uh, really nicely, uh, and there are other things obviously. Um, but I, I don't know to what extent you want us to to elaborate because there, that's that's well, quite a lot. Even to summarize, I'm hearing there's kind of more an administrative, clinical responsibility use case around documentation, and there's perhaps using these things to help with treatment. And if I think back to the summer, even the American Psychiatric Association, I realize we're a global group. At least I'd be very careful putting patient information into these systems that they don't have to follow privacy rules. So actually not be, don't be very careful, don't do it. Then I also read a lot of these kind of chatbots that claim to be AI chatbots may actually just be decision trees, right? The AI may be in the natural language processing, which is out of the box. And the chatbot is actually just a giant decision tree, which is still great. We, we respect that. But where do you, what do you guys think to see these benefits? How do we kind of get over those perhaps real world hurdles? Or like, what is the, what makes you most excited if you said, like, we're going to see AI really do this? Like, what is that thing? Uh, you, you know, I'll, I'll just use a small example of something that we were working on. And uh, over the past few weeks, and uh, not to go into details, but the thing is that uh, you as a clinician or as a professional could just carve out whatever it is that you want to be done. And in using natural language, you explain and you define what it is that you want. And then it either does it okay, or it does it nicely, or it doesn't uh, to some level okay. But then you could uh, figure out whether or not it, it really is something that requires the generative abilities, or it could be just translated into a decision tree. Either way, even if it's a simple rule-based uh, app, uh, the fact that uh, everyone could actually develop that today, uh, when we think about it, we can streamline a lot of, a lot of the work that is done today in, in, in mental health, for instance. And therefore, that's one use, and it's really important. So you don't need to start sitting with the engineers and so on and wait for a few years before or whatever to, to get things done. And, and that's democratization of, of knowledge and, and, and skills. Yeah. That makes sense, Orin. To your point, I forget who told me, but someone said, John, imagine if you could have a healthcare worker for $1 a day. What would the healthcare system you build look like if you had that level of staffing? If you had that many people, what would you do differently? And it's clearly a, an example. It's a little bit of hyperbole, but it, it gets to your point of 
what would be different and how would we deliver care with that? And perhaps you're saying it sooner than, than we think. What's your take, Amir, on that? I think, uh, you know, when, we, when we're looking at the mental health space uh, around the world, we know the pain points, you know, they're not new, uh, treatment gap, accessibility, et cetera. And we know that the more, uh, like the future is not right in that sense. Um, and we need augmentation. Obviously, again, not replacement, at, at least not now. I don't think that AI can replace a therapist. But in terms of augmentation, and even we look at conversational AI, all sorts of chatbots, as you mentioned, uh, uh, there are a lot of them, uh, even before ChatGPT uh, and Claude and other platforms. So I think that the, if it can somehow provide psychoeducation and some kind of a relief, uh, CBT practices, DBT, whatever, um, and again, doing it responsibly, which is, again, not the case right now because most of the app are not evidence-based, regulation is not there yet. Um, but if we're going to do it correctly, we're going to be able to, um, uh, to somehow decrease this gap and obviously people will suffer less, hopefully. And I think that we don't have a choice in that sense. And I think that it's a great opportunity again, if we do it uh, in the right manner. Uh, so we, we cannot miss it. I think the train has already left the station. Uh, we cannot say it's not, and it's not only obviously in mental health, all in all life domains, you know, education. And if we're talking about education, yeah, also um, a practitioner would need to know how to use AI. We're gonna have to educate them. Uh, what are the benefits? What are the risks? Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, we're just like in the beginning. Uh, it's like one year now for ChatGPT, I think, right? It's about one year that the uh, democratization of AI in, uh, last November. Uh, it's just the beginning, but uh, we're going to use it more and more. And uh, it, I think it's going to rev rev revolutionize uh, mental health uh, care um, and hopefully for the best. Yeah. Again, yeah. both of you are, are calling in from the Samuel A. Foundation Initiative for Responsible AI in Medicine. And that perhaps brings me to the issue of there's a reason you guys probably put the word responsible AI in medicine in your title. And I think, again, we've seen some pretty wild examples from the Coco chatbot that was kind of made news for kind of unethical uses of AI. We saw an eating disorder chatbot in the U.S., a couple months ago. So clearly we know that there are potential risks to these. What do you guys kind of from your vantage point see as, as those risks and what are we going to do to mitigate them to reach this potential <laughs> you just told us about? So, uh, you know, I'm thinking, uh, first of all, maybe I, I have to begin with the fact that the hype causes people to act as they are uh, in a kind of a competition to be first, uh, to be the best, to be showing something new. And it's very easy to be caught in that. Um, and I, I am guilty as charged. I, I, I enjoy playing. We have this kind of sandbox that uh, we have uh, initiated, this kind of group uh, in, in Israel, and it's wonderful. But we remember that this is kind of a sandbox. It's not yet used with uh, mostly with, with the patients, right? It's It's more kind of seeing what it could do. And that's mainly playing with the regular versions, not even the API uh, and so on. Um, but then uh, when you have to uh, translate that into a uh, product, something that would be used in healthcare systems, then one needs to uh, think about what does it mean to, to deploy that? And um, so you you mentioned the issue of, of, of privacy, right? And, and I think you, you were alluding to that. And so theoretically, uh, when I use, uh, you know, whatever chat GPT, for instance, then uh, I pay $20 and I could decide that my, the information I put inside uh, could be uh, deleted or not be retained. And I could either believe them or not that they're doing it, okay? I would assume that they do, but then like um, if you're a healthcare system, then you could have, uh, you could use APIs, you could, uh, have um, uh, cloud computing with uh, privacy-related uh, 
uh, protections, with uh, HIPAA compliancy. So that's not things that are uh, not possible. But if you really want to be sure, you can use a local kind of uh, uh, model. And in a way, uh, as Harvard uh, were talking about, they wanted to create Harvard Medical School. They said, well, we want to have uh, chat GPT for our students, but we want to train it only on the Harvard uh, Medical School material so we know what's in it, okay? And uh, I don't know where you guys are at with this, but conceptually, it's as long as you have enough funding to build your own model to start from scratch, that's that's a good solution. Uh, and, and you have other uh, technical alternatives. It doesn't have to be beginning from nothing. So I think in a way uh, you are correct that one needs to consider privacy. And a part of that would be transparency. So you can tell you know patients, look, uh, you're currently using something. You have to know that, uh, you know, just be transparent about it. But in a way, if you're a healthcare system, it's not enough just to say, you know what, this is the disclaimer, read it, and every liability, whatever, you're responsible. That's not good enough. What do you think, Amir? Right, I think that uh, over the past two or three years, uh, we see a lot of uh, guidelines and um, from different agency, either the big tech that are talking about responsible AI using in different domains, also held. We see the WHO, uh, soon they're going to uh, release a new publication about using uh, large, large language mo mo models in, in health. And there are kind of like the, let's say, eight, between eight to 10 uh, principles that you need to, uh, to refer to when you were developing and deploying uh, AI solutions, uh, generative AI solutions in, in health and mental health. So, for example, the, uh, we talk, they're talking a lot about uh, the bias in algorithms and uh, discrimination sometimes, uh, because again, it's it's based on on the current data sets mostly. Uh, if the data sets are biased, so it's a problem. And they're talking about privacy and. Uh, uh, all sort of uh, informed inf informed consent, and of course, uh, a lot of uh, especially uh, um, the mental health professionals they're uh, really upset about the fact that the, the therapeutic relationships uh, would uh, change. Uh, there is like a a, a third uh, entity in the in the in the room. Uh, so yeah, I think that. There is a lot of um, things that we should take into consideration. I think that, um, as I mentioned before, the regulators are not there yet, even though Biden now uh, released like a new, uh, not specifically about health, but yes, about the AI. So uh, I think that we know what are the main um, um, risks and we should uh, address them. And in that sense, even when, as I mentioned right now, we're working like on a project and uh, due to the war in Israel, uh, I think that the fact that uh, all stakeholders uh, are part of the uh, design and the development phase is really important. Both mental health professionals, I would say even patients, family caregivers, all stakeholders should be part of it. And then we would be able to mitigate the risks, uh, but definitely should address it, yeah. So that makes sense. I think we've learned even just in a world of mobile apps that co-design with people, all people using the product from the beginning always helps as you kind of said, or in like a co-pilot, human in the loop makes a lot of sense. We're, we're kind of seeing the rise of coaches or digital navigators supporting apps. So, so I think we can bring prior things we've learned about the harms. And I think one interesting question is, Amir, you kind of raised a list of there's bias, there's informed consent, there's all these issues that we know about. If we have to convey kind of what is responsible AI, if you have to give people kind of a one or two sentence pitch, like what is that guiding signpost of what does responsible AI mean quickly? And I'll go first since I pose this hard question. Maybe it means just do no harm, right? If we take kind of some of the underlying medical principles it's, it's we don't want to cause harm be it in the development testing or deployment but that that may be a very simplistic definition of, of what what is responsible ai well i think you started with the first principle right so uh first do no harm but then 
there is a se- there has to be a second thing because if medicine is only about doing no harm, then medicine is not that useful, is it? And therefore, uh, one needs to also look at benefit. And for instance, uh, because the harm doesn't need to be direct harm, it could be indirect harm, and we need to consider that as well. So, you know, I've talked to you yesterday, and I, I, I view you as a person who is not only nice and intelligent, but I actually look at you as a person with a high epistemic authority. I uh, listen to what you have to say. I trust you, although I don't know you for a long time. Now, the question is, what happens when uh, instead of uh, John, there is the avatar John, uh, and it's not just John, it's 100 other professors, uh, each of them the expert of the experts, and I may uh, look at this machine and give it a very high epistemic authority, not necessarily uh, for the right reasons, right? So, so one element might be to over rely on it. Another could be to rely less on 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 the medical professionals or or the healthcare professionals. But it could also happen to to me. I was like, well, when I'm tired, I do mistakes. This thing never gets tired, and it got access to all the new stuff. I may have not read the past. Uh, I don't know, uh, New England Journal. Maybe there was something really important there, or, or JAMA, or whatever. And so in a way, so that's, I mean, it's it's like an indirect risk, but we need to consider that. And it relates to another thing. And that is whenever we get new technology in the room or in, in, in the system, people rightfully so may be a little bit suspicion, uh, suspicious. And I think to, and, and I think only if we do what Amir suggested, that is to actually do it together with the stakeholders, can we actually make sure that they they know that this could actually bring them whatever it is that they need. So the last thing I want to say is, so okay, so do no harm, yeah. But then also efficacy is really important. And and, and it, need to, it needs to be compared at least to the, let's say, parallel things that we might have that are not AI-based or not technology-based. And if it costs a lot of money and it does it the same way, maybe it's not that useful anyway, right? Uh, or if it causes a lot of whatever, uh, it harms the environment. So. So that's another thing I would uh, consider. I just want to say one last thing about, so we talk about equity and or, or bias, lack of bias. And so in a way, bias might be something that is not just in the material that it uh, trains on. I mean, if we tag the material, if we decide how we define the material, then actually it's the bias of the people who are working on the system. So in a way, if it's human, based in a way bias may always be there and i think we can learn from our work on ai to then go to ourselves and look at our own biases and, and do the same work that we're trying to do on the machine i like that risk benefit approach towards responsibles there's going to probably be some risk there's benefits and we have to explore them and especially but for the benefits you, you have to compare it to a valid comparison group as I like to say, you can't have one group look at a wall, and the other group gets to use a chatbot and then declare that the chatbot is is better. But I want to quickly switch over. Maybe you guys for a couple seconds could explain what the special edition is. And then I'll I'll open it up to some questions. I think we started about three minutes late, so we'll go three minutes late. But I do want to keep us a little bit snappy. So tell us about the special edition in a nutshell. Amir, do you want to? Yeah, sure. So um uh, due to the fact that um, a lot of people, um, you know, general population, but also mental health professionals are starting to using generative AI. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, new apps and all sort of uh, products. Uh, we wanted to uh, highlight the facts uh, that, um, that we're talking here. We need to use it respons- in a responsible manner. And in that special issue, we want to uh, hear, uh, I would say, um, in many different perspectives, it can be either like a more uh, conceptualization about the field of uh, gen- using generative AI in a responsible manner. Uh, people can use, uh, there are a lot of uh, new use cases about it, uh, that people are already using generative AI in all sort of uh, uh, settings in the mental health space. Uh, So I think that mostly, since, again, it's new, we want to know what people are thinking about it, what people are doing about it, and to look also at the future and uh, um, see how can we best uh, use it, I think. So 
obviously there is like an elaborative elaborated uh, description of of the purpose of the um special issue but we hope to uh, receive and we started to receive interesting interesting papers again from uh, either mental health professionals, but can be also from other uh, disciplines uh, in this uh, space. Uh, and again, it can be a perspective of um, either mental health professionals or developers or uh, consumers. Uh, we're, we're open to get, since again, it's a, it's a new field, I think that we're pretty uh, open to get um, uh, different kind of uh, uh, manuscripts um, or so anything like that. You said the word open yeah. several times, but uh, not uh, relating to any company. Um, so, um, yeah, so, and I think uh, some of the papers will have uh, multi uh, professional groups as well. So, a combination of people who are doing more of the uh, engineering and, and software, and others that are looking more at the legal or uh, ethical aspects or societal aspects. Um, so, you know, for instance, uh, um, um, the concept of uh, decision uh, support for people with disabilities, uh, AI uh, based, which is uh, an interesting uh, novel idea. Could we do that? It's been done by people so far, right? Um, and, and so things uh, like that, and maybe just seeing what new things are being developed as we talk, because we just gave a few examples. There's so many interesting stuff, uh, neural feedback that is uh, built on AI. We, we're, we're meeting with experts every day, hearing about amazing stuff that's already being researched and, and, and so on. And just let us uh, remind ourselves that uh, we have the AI Act uh, pending in, in the European uh, Union, uh, which is very much risk-based. Uh, so it's really your approach, right? So, you know, just uh, chatbots are considered limited risk, for instance. So it's not a very high risk. Uh, emotion recognition as well, just uh, limited risk in the AI uh, Act in, in, in the European Union. Um, and then we have uh, just a newly released uh, draft, right, in the US. So, so basically, the regulatory field is, is, is going to become quite more uh, clear over the next month or so. And that would mean that if people started to develop things and may have not done it in a way that one could trace back exactly what they did when they started and how they measured the risks and what were the cases that uh, failed and how they failed and so on, they will not be compliant. And it's a big issue around the world right now, uh, whether or not one is going to be compliant with those regulations. And so it's also very relevant, even if you're really just focused on developing, you have to know that at some point, uh, regulation will, will, let, will, will force us to, to show what we've done so yeah so it sounds like most most papers and ideas would, would be relevant i think people from all backgrounds could do it so in the words of a very famous canadian psychiatrist david gratzer who, who has a podcast series we're going to do quick takes on the questions we're going to go quickly because we're running out of time so you may guys have to give really fast questions because zohar has a fantastic question he says how do you see the balance between democratization processes and accessibility of personal knowledge to different populations? And on the other hand, the risk of concentration of knowledge by a small number of corporations and that knowledge is mostly based on information from Western culture. So huge question, what is your quick take? <laughs> a big question, a uh, quick take. So yeah, there's a lot of discussion about that and are those companies specifically located in one place? So one of the solutions is uh, having more localized models as well. And, uh, and we refer to that and that is starting to happen. At the same time, there are some market uh, things that influence. Yeah, big companies are able to develop uh, bigger and more impressive uh, capacities sometimes. And I, I'm not sure there is a good uh, solution to that other than philanthropic uh, kind of uh, equity by those companies opening up to different cultures, uh, you know, giving a portion of their uh, wealth to uh, improve uh, equity. And I think the fact that most of those companies actually initiated a responsible and ethics uh, group uh, might uh, lead us to see that they might be doing that, whether because they want to do it or because they will be pushed uh, to do it. Makes sense. Amir, what's your two sentence response to concentration of knowledge versus democratization of knowledge? It's a hard one. Uh oh, we may have frozen. Oh, yeah. 
No, Amir, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I was planning to, uh, uh, be, uh, before, like, uh, just like one sentence about what Zohar asked. Hi, Val. Um, uh, so um, we see a lot of, like, in the ecosystem, we see a lot of groups around the world. For example, there is, like, the Responsible AI Africa uh, that are becoming sort of, like, advocacy groups uh, that are working with the uh, big tech companies, and they're, like, assuring that... Uh, in that sense, we can fix the, the human bias, the human discrimination. And in that sense, they see like an opportunity that actually AI can uh, even fix current biases and specifically in healthcare also. So I think that in that sense, it can be also an opportunity because as we mentioned before, the bias is coming from people, not from the machines, yeah. Um, yeah, there are really good questions here. And so we don't have a lot of time. I'll try to, to take on, uh... Ayman's uh, um, question. Yeah, that is the so, last one, just to keep okay. up. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm saying, you know, there's a lot of development. So what would you say are the processes or guidelines that you recommend for ethically evaluating new generative AI models before deploying in the mental health care field? That's a small question with a very long answer. I'm just going to say that there are several companies that have been working on that exactly. So to streamline this process, beginning with before deploying, it, it starts with uh, the planning. So it really depends on which organization you want to go. It's talking and seeing who are the people who will be involved with that, uh, seeing what kind of uh, needs they have. So it's it's a very streamlined uh, process. So I think uh, I may not be able to answer everything now, but it starts with the planning, the design, then choosing the material that one would be training on, uh, choosing how one would, uh, let's say, tag or, or uh, decide uh, what the material means, uh, uh, looking at potential biases. So it's, it's a very uh, streamlined process with, with many phases before even considering deploying it. Yeah. And I may say Max Burks' with excellent question is, what can academic and publishing communities do to improve training sets across languages? I think this is something that the Society of Digital Psychiatry can likely take up and think about as an initiative. It, it, we do need, if we want these things to be trained well, they need the best data. And hopefully in academics, we're producing good data. That should be good used for good purposes. So to keep us close to schedule, let's break here. I think we have to thank JMIR Mental Health, JMIR Journals for sponsoring the webinar of Society of Digital Psychiatry. Thank all of you for attending the many questions that we got. If you want to present or share what you're doing on different perspectives, someone once told me anything of a battery can be digital health now. So if you have anything in the digital health space you want to talk about, just reach out. We're happy to talk. We have the special edition. So thank you to everyone and till next time.